Thank you, Al. That was a really good, inspiring five minutes, I think. It was, I think he packed it in like an hour. <laughs> so it was a really good start, and Al has set the stage for us to have a, you know, what to come for the rest of the day. So thank you again, Al, for your time. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome um, our first keynote presenter, Associate Professor Betty Lesk, um, to present to us on internationalization at home. And it's about good ideas and curriculum innovation. But before that, I, I will read out um, some of um, Betty's um, achievements. Associate Professor Betty West is an Associate Professor in Internationalization of the Curriculum of the University of South Australia. On Australian National Teaching, she's also an Australian National Teaching Fellow, Visiting Professor of Leeds Metropolitan University in the UK, a member of the Scientific Committee of the Centre for Higher Education Internationalisation of the University of the Universita uh, Catholica del Serca Kerr, the Sacred Heart of um, in Milan, you know, the uh, Catholic uh, University, and co-editor with Hans D. Witt of the Journal of Studies in International Education. The focus of her work is linking theory and practice in internationalisation. She has done this in various roles, including as Dean of Teaching and Learning in Business and Coordinator of International Staff and Student Services at the University of South Australia. <coughs> uh, Betty's ALTC National Teaching Fellowship was awarded in 2010, was focused on internationalisation of the curriculum in different <coughs> disciplinary and in institutional contexts. Associate Professor Lesk has been an elected member of the International Education Association of Australia Board since 2006. She was the founding chair of the Association's Internationalization of the Curriculum and Special Interest Group and is currently chair of the research. I now like to invite Associate Professor Ray Lesk to give the first keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming, for and the people who organised this, for inviting me to be part of it, and for the pleasure of being part of the reference group of this project and watching it develop over the years. And I know from experience that it will probably never finish. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news to those people who are involved. Um, hopefully it's good news. So I wanted to, uh, my role today is really to set the context. I've got about 30 minutes where I'm just going to be running through some information quite quickly. Some of it some of you will have seen before, some of it is new, so I'm hoping that there's something for everyone in this. And that my little clicker will work. It helps if you turn it on. <laughs> this isn't saying the world over. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what are we going to do? Well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about connecting innovation, internationalisation and student learning because this is all about innovation, good ideas um, and internationalisation, of course, is about student learning. Fundamentally, it needs to be about student learning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about global citizens, referring back to the concept of graduate attributes, internationalisation of the curriculum as a concept and internationalisation at home as a related concept. <coughs> a little bit about innovation and good ideas. Recommend that you watch a YouTube video when you get home tonight, because uh, there's not quite time to watch it today, but there are some, some, some interesting things to be seen in that space. And just talk a little bit about the opportunities and challenges that this area of internationalisation, internationalisation at home um, and innovation, um, what some of those opportunities and challenges are. The overall question I think we need to be thinking about um, and that in fact I think this project epitomises is the question of how can we foster curriculum innovation and facilitate student learning in an internationalised curriculum at home. Okay, internationalisation in a globalised world, important for all students, so we're focusing on all students. Typically we see a focus on things that happen at the side. This is an option for people. It's no longer an option. The world is globalised whether we like it or not. We can't, in fact, locally work without being connected globally. It's linked to the development of intercultural competence for future life. So all of the definitions of internationalisation of the curriculum pick up on the intercultural 
And people often ask me, what's the difference? Why don't we talk about interculturalisation? An easy way to, to think about the difference of those things is that internationalisation is about the difference between nations, between nation states, intercultural is about something different, cultural difference, something that's much more fundamental in fact to the way that we think about the world and the way that we see ourselves. And often people will distinguish between those two and say, well, the international is about knowledge and the intercultural is about relationships, about getting along with people, about understanding people, about respect. And I think that was a really important point. Respect is different from tolerance. Mm -hmm. It's very different. And we have to go back then to also to the fundamentals of what it means to be a university. We are preparing students to be professionals to be researchers, professional researchers, to be good thinkers, to be good workers, but we're also preparing them to be good human beings, social beings. And I think sometimes we get the balance a little bit wrong. Maybe we focus, as we all do sometimes, on one side of that picture and not on the other. So some of this internationalisation at home, I put to you, is about getting that balance right. Characteristics of global citizens. Now, there are many attribute statements, um, and I have in the past put forward the indicators that my own university uses for graduate quality number seven, international perspectives. But of course, there's also a graduate quality about communication and about working in groups, and they all relate to internationalisation as well. But I wanted to share with you today some recent reading that I've been doing from Martha Nussbaum who is um, a social scientist from the United States. How many of you know her work? Yeah? So this is a quote from one of her recent publications where she talks about what, what are the ideal characteristics of global citizens. And she talks about the ability to examine, reflect, argue, debate, deferring to neither tradition nor authority. But of course, in order to not defer to tradition, one has to understand tradition what is tradition. To recognise fellow citizens, and she's talking there about not just about people in this room, but fellow citizens in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in, in uh, uh, Colombia, as having equal rights, regardless of difference in race, gender, <coughs> religion, sexuality. So immediately we see an expansion <coughs> of that idea of diversity and difference. Having concern for the lives of others, this is deeply about the human being, the social being. Imagining well, what a wonderful word, imagine. We're going to come back to that later. Understanding complex issues, informed by a wide range of human stories. Don't you love <coughs> the discourse? I love this discourse. In my <coughs> own nation, and life as part of a complicated world order. Complexity, not simplicity. How often do we try as teachers to make things more simple so students can understand them? Sometimes we need to make them more complex. Internationalisation at home. So I'm not having segues here. I'm going through some information quite quickly because I want to pull all threads together as we go. The concept of internationalisation at home, a useful way to focus our attention on what we do in our classrooms and on our campuses at home to ensure the systematic development of these capabilities in all students. Now that's taken from a larger paper, but it relates to those capabilities on that previous slide as well. So, at home, in classrooms, on our campuses, in our communities, thinking about bringing the community in. The local, the international, <coughs> juxtaposed all the time, interrelated. The potential <coughs> of internationalisation at home. Some of you may know the work of Joe Mestenhauser from the US. He talked about, um, in fact he wrote an article with the title Internationalisation at Home, a brilliant idea awaiting implementation. See the connection with the title of my talk today? A brilliant idea awaiting implementation. Here you are with a brilliant idea, perhaps with many brilliant ideas, but the brilliant idea, the concept, you're involved in that implementation. That's the really exciting part. 
further from Joe, it offers the possibility of finding a new way in which higher education mainstreams the international dimension. It's not just for the edges and the periphery, it's for everyone. In all segments of universities, so this is getting much closer to the notion of comprehensive internationalisation that John Huntley talks about. Reforms the curriculum. Think about the word reform, it's a strong word. Mobilises community resources. Institutionalises <coughs> international education. And focuses on relevance to the global job market. So we're unpacking that concept of internationalisation at home. Jos Balin, who's here with us today, and you'll hear more from him at the end of the day, in a recently published article, <coughs> talks about um, gives a summary, actually, of um, the issues that come to the forefront when you start to think about internationalisation of the curriculum. Some of those issues being the involvement of academic staff in the process. My own work has shown that there are some challenges in that. Challenges of time, challenges of conceptual <coughs> uh, understanding of the concept of internationalisation, so what does it really mean in my discipline? Disciplinary interpretation and variation, what does it look like in different places? Professional development, support, how to go about nurturing that and helping people through that process when we know how busy academic staff are doing all of the things that they're required to do as a matter of routine. How can we make internationalisation at home routine? The formal versus the informal curriculum. What do we do in the extracurricular that supports what's happening in the formal curriculum? And how can we get all of those things to work together? And the deliberate assessment of learning outcomes. And the word deliberate is very important there. Deliberate, not accidental, not and, and completely upfront and explicit. Some definitions of internationalisation of the curriculum. Because, because as you can see, the discourse around internationalisation at home is tied up with the discourse around internationalisation of the curriculum. People often ask, well, what's the difference? You know, if we look at internationalisation of the curriculum, this is a, a definition that I used as part of a fellowship and research work that I recently completed. Well like this project, it's not completed, it's ongoing. The incorporation of an international and inter cultural dimension into preparation, delivery, outcomes. It's the whole thing, it's the whole process. But it leads to something else, an internationalised curriculum. And what might that look like? A purpose, the purposeful, think back to deliberate, deliberate purposeful development of international and intercultural perspectives, skills, knowledge and attitudes of all students. Think about then quickly what is the curriculum. We're thinking about the formal curriculum, the informal curriculum, the co-curriculum, the sort of stuff that happens on campus. We're also thinking about the hidden curriculum, the messages we send when we choose our content and we publish our reading lists and all of it comes from Australia or the US. None of it gives an alternative perspective. How often do we make those messages clear that we're teaching actually from this perspective, from this body of knowledge here, not this body of knowledge here. We might choose to make reference to this body of knowledge over here. Sometimes we don't even acknowledge that it exists. We don't tolerate <coughs> it. We don't respect it. We leave it over there. We ignore it. So sometimes thinking about internationalisation at home and internationalisation of the curriculum requires a mental effort of thinking outside of those little boundaries. And I'm reminded just briefly of a, uh, a workshop actually that Shanton Chang is here uh, run and he, he, this is a, an activity that he starts his workshop with that has really stuck with me over the years. Um, I don't, Shanton doesn't know that this has had such a dramatic impact on me and some of you might have had the same experience in his workshop. So what he asks you to do is to think about what you think a farm is. You know, get a picture in your head of what a farm is and so you do that and then something else. And then he throws up a picture on the screen as to what's in his head about what a farm looks like. And it's a farm in Malaysia, is it not? It's very different from the farm 
that I was thinking of, the wheat sheep farm. I was recently, in fact, in, on Monday, in Canada at the University of Alberta, and they were giving me a campus tour. And they said, Let me ta let's take you to see the oval. And I thought, well, this would be interesting. I don't have my snow boots on. It's minus five. It's snowing. There's a wind blowing. It's a bit blizzardy out there. Well, this would be fun, you know. I didn't really bring this sort of equipment. But off we went. We stayed inside. And we went to the oval, which was tiered, roofed, and in the centre, no grass, not green. I've got this image in my head of green. Not snowed on either because of the roof. It's a running track. It's got two skating rinks <laughs> in the centre. The fastest skating rink, I'm told, in the world. It's the Olympic oval. So this is a very different... Here I am in Canada thinking, there's so much in common, you know, Australia, Canada, we love each other. We've both got British heritage. You know, we're, we're very similar. But these things are embedded in our heads. And there are differences that we can easily overlook. And I think those images are just a sort of illustration of what might lie deeper in terms of our thinking about. So we have to think, therefore, what messages are we sending with that hidden curriculum? When, for example, we require international students and international students only to attend sessions on training in intercultural competence. It's a message we're sending that domestic Australian students, who are themselves multicultural, of course, know how to do all of that stuff, <coughs> or it's not their responsibility. It's the international students who need to be doing that cross-cultural work. So, the curriculum, very broad sense. Internationalisation at home, a broad sense of home. Think back to those definitions. Think back to Joe Mestenhauser talking about the community. But this is not just what happens in class, indeed on campus, but it might also be what happens in the broader community. Think of that definition of diversity, about gender, sexuality. All of those things are part of diversity. But today, and also the international, the national side of cultural. Okay. And then a quote here from um, Green and Matova that we're also talking about the envisioned curriculum, what we want to achieve, <coughs> the global aim, statement of purpose, the developed curriculum, actually how we put it all together, the assessed curriculum. If we don't do that, we know how much attention will be paid to what we're doing. The enacted or taught curriculum, how we get that to happen, and the learned curriculum. And this is a bit... I mean, we know a little about this, we know least, I think, about the impact on student learning. So, good ideas. Let's connect with good ideas. Well, Ralph Emerson, um, a famous American essayist and poet, thanks to Wikipedia. <coughs> okay. All good ideas require hard work, patience, and the ability to seize opportunities and overcome challenges to transform them into reality. How many of you relate to that? in relation to internationalisation at home. Hard work, patience, the ability to seize opportunities. And I said to you that I was going to recommend to you a video. Steve Johnson, how many people know his book Where Do Good Ideas Come From? If you're ever travelling through an airport, you're bound to find it in one of the, in one of the airport bookshops. But he is in fact has taken a very scholarly approach to looking at where good ideas come from. He's researched all of the great breakthroughs in science. He's looked at how they came about. And if you Google where the good ideas come from, not a hard name to remember, or Steve Johnson, and you can have the slides afterwards if you, want, if you haven't got a pen, you'll come up with two YouTube videos. One is 20 minutes long and one is four minutes long. What do you like about that? You've got a little bit of time, you can watch the short one. You want to go back for more, you watch the longer one. But he talks about hunches, needing time to incubate, incubate to become good ideas, even great ideas. That, you know, that notion of you sitting under the tree and then 
the apple falls on your head and I'm mixing a whole lot of things here together or, you know, a flash of brilliance. You often see the light bulb on the head. But often these things, because they don't in fact happen like that, but good ideas are often a little thing that happens in the back of your head and then it grows and develops. And in fact, if you talk to other people about it and share it, and they have maybe a similar hunch or something slightly different, that this might lead to a great idea. He says, rather disturbingly, that most great ideas take about 10 years to develop. Mm -hmm. The good thing is that this year, next year, next year is the 10th anniversary of internationalisation at home. Yay. So it could go from a good idea <laughs> to a great idea. But hunches need to collide with other hunches. The collaboration <coughs> in order to create is actually confirmed by the notion <coughs> that chance favours the connected mind. And that is his message. Mm -hmm. That we need to connect with each other, within our disciplines, across our disciplines. And he says, ICT, information technology, email, all those sorts of, Google, Wikipedia, <coughs> all those sorts of things are ways in which we can connect with other people's hunches even if we're not connected with them. And what a wealth of opportunity that is mm -hmm. for all of us in creating new curricula, new opportunities for learning with our students within our disciplines and very importantly across our disciplines. And thinking about how what we do in business or nursing or engineering might connect with what's happening in psychology around intercultural competence development around education in relation to curriculum design and curriculum theory. So getting all of those connections happening and making good ideas great ideas. Now, good ideas, of course, need to develop and you can get people together and you can... I don't know if you can see the point of this picture, but this is a good idea that was not well implemented. <laughs> so there they are trying to build something and it's, it's a complete disaster. So we might want to, for today, maybe do something different. I mean, the word innovate comes from the Latin, to change. We might want to seek different learning outcomes. When we start to get down to the level of detail, we're starting to get to the sort of work that we're doing and we've seen done in this project. Students and teachers doing different things, behaving differently, organising themselves differently, in and out of class, on campus and importantly in the community. Thinking about what might we do rather than what could we do. What could we do is normally restricted. What might we do is open imagination. Think back to that notion of imagination. What might we do? Let's not be restricted by something. And I uh, go back to another story about um, my recent experience in the university in the US where they were talking about they wanted to do something exciting. They wanted to put in place an innovative centre for learning and teaching. So they needed some money for infrastructure. So they thought, well, we won't have any money for that, so we'll just forget about that idea and we'll just have to do this. And the DBC academic equivalent said, no, let's imagine we've got the money. What might we do with it? So they did that. They wrote up a proposal. They went to a donor. They got $40 million in three quarters of an hour of meeting. Now, this is the sort of thing that we can't imagine in Australia. Maybe we need to be more imaginative. This slide is a, is a slide of the process of, of uh, internationalisation of the curriculum. It came out of the um, National Teaching Fellowship work that I was supposed to complete uh, about 18 months ago, but which is still ongoing, actually. Um, because this work is ongoing. This is a process. It's kind of never finished, if you like. And you see that in this this looks a lot like an action research cycle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, curriculum design, I think, and curriculum reform and curriculum review is an action research cycle. It's evidence-based practice. It's what we're all very good at as academics. We just need to apply it to this field in a slightly different way. And of course, you would start with the classic review and reflect, find that you don't have the right information, 
want to go back and collect some of that, think about what you might collect, be thinking ahead all the time about the sort of evidence you want to collect. You review and reflect. Can you imagine what you might do? Have some fun with it. Play with it. Have some dreams. And then try to make some of those dreams reality. Oh, of course you're allowed to imagine and dream. You might then have to get down to the negotiation around what's possible. But you know, if you don't dream and put it out there, you might never find that there's something available there for you. And sometimes I'm reminded of, the, of the, um, uh, one of the first pieces of advice that Professor Denise Bradley, as Vice-Chancellor at the University of South Australia, gave me when I was new into an into a Associate Dean teaching and learning role. She said, Betty, I want you to get people from here to right over there in relation to teaching and learning, but you're only going to get them there one step at a time. And I understand that. As long as you know where you want them to be, as long as they're part of that process of getting there, just take them there one step at a time. That's all we can ask. So the big picture, the short term, the long term plan. Thinking also about, therefore, once you've done it, imagining, revising and planning, picking off what you can do one step at a time, doing something about it, gathering the evidence to show that it works and that you need that extra $10,000 next year in your budget to be able to do the next stage and evaluating the impact. So, an ongoing process. And this conceptual framework of internationalisation of the curriculum, both of these things are summarised on a hard copy brochure that I hoped to have for you today to hand out. I have it somewhere in the Australia Post system because rather than taking it to Canada, taking a hundred of those to Canada with me, I decided I'd post them before I left. I've been to Canada and back and they're still not here from Adelaide to Queensland. Isn't that amazing? So, but there are copies available on the web and you can download them. Basically what this shows is that this top half is about curriculum design. There's nothing new in that bit. Requirements of professional practice and citizenship, the social and, and, the human, and human being as well as the professional being. We're not just creating widgets who will go out there and make money for themselves. <laughs> Assessment, how you're going to assess those learning outcomes and then systematically develop them across the program. What often happens within the disciplines though, and we know that as discipline, members of discipline communities, we're part of the global, globally connected community, but there's also other communities out there and they're culturally different as well. So we need to be connecting and talking to them. But we tend to work through dominant paradigms rather than thinking necessarily about the emerging. And yet in, in universities, that's our job. Are we not meant to be at the cutting edge? Pushing the boundaries. Actually contributing to those emerging paradigms. What I found in my work when I looked um, at at internationalisation of the curriculum and talked to staff in universities across Australia. About 17 of them also worked with, with um, Wendy and Craig in more detail in, uh, at Murdoch University in UQ. We worked with uh, Jos and talked to him about the work that he was doing in different parts of Europe and with other people working in the UK. I found that, in fact, the institutional context is really important. The global graduate attributes, they're a good driver. The local context is important and academics were very worried about that. What about the local professional association? Mm -hmm. What will happen to me if my course is de-accredited, mm -hmm. delisted, mm -hmm. because I've done something I shouldn't do? So there's a degree of, of concern about those issues and we have to consider the local as part of the international. The national and regional context, Australia is part of Asia, but not an Asian country. <coughs> We have to think also about what it might mean in places like South Africa. Very different. So we expect to see difference. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the concept. And the global context. What sort of a world do we live in? What sort of a world do we want to live in? How can we equip our students as professionals and citizens to contribute to the future of that world? A good future. So what were some of the opportunities that are identified in the research around internationalisation at home, cross-disciplinary conversations. 
brilliant opportunity for that to happen today and as an ongoing part of this process as you build your networks. A program focus, working in program teams. People often say, oh, I hear university managers say, we've got a multicultural staff population. We heard that this morning. How often does that interaction occur across the community the staff community? How often within the program team does that happen? How often are the international staff members teaching the stuff that sits on the side that's optional and the rest of the people are designing what's happening for everybody, the people like us? So a program focus can begin to bring in those international people from different cultural backgrounds into the conversation about curriculum construction who are coming sometimes from a very similar educational background so they've enculturated into the discipline but they maybe also have been marginalised to a degree. Engagement with diversity on class, in class and on campus and internationalisation of campus culture are opportunities. Making sure that the way we do things around here is we interact. We're interculturally aware. We're building our skills and knowledge and connecting with diversity in the local community. The challenge, natural resistance to change. Lack of skills and knowledge. Staff telling me, oh, we don't know what it means. We, we, we're part of this discipline of medicine. And this is what we know. Breaking out of that is quite hard. Our own cultural conditions, dominant paradigm. The things that we take for granted. The image of oval, of farm that we take for granted, we don't even question until it's thrown in front of us and we're asked to question it. Pedagogy, what works? What doesn't? How do we get students to engage with this stuff? Assessing the learning outcome and getting the rewards right for staff and students. Promotion. Those sorts of rewards that come for staff but also for students, learning outcomes, employment outcomes time and effort required. This is complex work. So, changing our pedagogy, a little bit of a lighter note. Here we are. How often do we do this? At the bottom, for those of you who can't see it, it says, I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. <laughs> and you'll tell me back what I want to hear in the exam and in the report that I'm set to you. How do we balance that? with needing to actually have some control over the curriculum. How often do, as institutions, we say this to our staff? Do exactly as we tell you and be innovative. So, to conclude, I'm getting close to the end. Opportunities to share hunches, ideas, possibilities. This is what innovation and internationalisation of the curriculum is about. It doesn't matter much if you do it in the coffee shop or in your office <coughs> or in your program team meetings. You probably need to do it in all of those places online with colleagues in different parts of the world. Leverage off those partnerships your institutions have. This is like a system. It works. It moves together. Innovation friendly reward and management systems. So that if you do innovate, you're not punished if it doesn't work the first time. Challenges to dominant paradigms. Thinking differently, doing different things. They all work together they all need to be focused on developing all student international and intercultural competencies. In conclusion then, the characteristics of innovative <coughs> internationalisation at home, internationalisation as a great idea, your challenges are taken for granted in all areas of the curriculum, even the challenge, even challenges are taken for granted in your own head. You'll arouse curiosity, mobilise the imagination. Yours and your students. You'll share hunches and ideas, learn together. <coughs> Not be afraid to say, I don't know. Students, staff, communities will do some new things and they'll do some of the things they've been doing for a long time differently. It will touch content, pedagogy, assessment, it should put you in contact with people you would never normally have talked to before. People from the learning and teaching centre, people from other disciplines, people down the corridor. How often when I was in, in institutions in different parts of the country, 
did I say to people saying, you know, we don't have the skills in our team to do that. Well, guess what? Three doors down, there's someone who is researching in that area. Maybe you could talk to them. Engagement across intellectual traditions and with cultural others in and across communities. And by this I'm talking about thinking about what does it mean <coughs> that I've just got this bit of knowledge and that I'm not even, what else is out there? Why do I take for granted that this is all there is? And maybe you, all I need to do is tell my students that there is other stuff out there. Sometimes, and what we're finding in, in some places, is the students are driving this because they know it's out there now. They're very connected. Often from school, but sometimes also independently through the web. International as well as local collaboration and conversation. That's the importance of those international networks in and across disciplines. The final word from Ralph Emerson again. Good ideas must work through the brain and the arm. Some of it's heavy lifting work. Of good and brave men. Now remember this is 1800. So we put men and women. <laughs> <laughs> or they are no better than dreams. So we have to dream. The challenge is to make the dream a reality in this space. That's all from me. Except if you want some further information, you can contact me on email. I've got a Twitter account and I'm starting to use it. It's quite good fun. Um, you could tweet about, if you've got a Twitter account, you can tweet about today, right now. There's the internationalisation of the curriculum SIG that Wendy and Craig um, are co-convening. There's the IAH uh, SIG in the European Association <coughs> that the Yoss convenes. There's the internationalisation of the curriculum in action website where you can get that brochure that I talked about that has some resources to support each part of that process. That in combination with a range of other resources are available and there's some references for you if you want to chase up <coughs> Martha Moosebaum's book, which was $10.99 and the best $10.99 I ever spent. Just a nice read. Um, can you have to subscribe? Yes. Yes, it'll be available on the website. What was the title of the book? I know. It's, it's 2010. It's called yeah, Not for Profit Why Democracy Needs the Humanities. She's on a bit of a rant about the fact that the humanities are dying and that nobody appreciates the humanities anymore. But she's got a fabulous, fabulous sort of story to tell. And I've got the end. <coughs> so I think perfect timing. Mm -hmm. I think we have some question time, you know, maybe a couple of questions. Sure. Anybody else got some questions? Hi, I'm Linda. Um, I just want to say how refreshing it is to hear um, an esteemed academic such as yourself talk to us about all of the other knowledge that's out there that we turn our back on. I know when I was doing a PhD, um, you know, we look at the Judeo-Christian and that's it, and yet there's all of that other knowledge. So I just want to say thank you for doing that and including it in your talk because it gives us leverage to use that work and build on that to support all of the other knowledge that's out there. So thank you. Thanks, Linda. Any other questions? Comments? Well, I'm certainly one. Um, okay. How do you um, how do you encourage you know staff to um, connect with such a program as internationalising the curriculum? Because often, as you say, we look at the mainstream. We don't really look at what's on the side. Um, what strategies can we give us as teachers and clinicians to work with that? Got several key things that I think you need to do. You need to be working in program teams. You need to identify who are the champions in your program team. Those discussions initially need to happen around the discipline. It's quite amazing how often you can get a group of people together in the same discipline and program team. They've never had a conversation before about what internationalisation of the curriculum means. And then suddenly find, especially if you throw in someone from the outside to ask dumb questions, you know, a fairly obvious question, but that, you know, you're an outsider, so you can be forgiven for asking the stupid question, if you like, to get that discussion happening, to bring those people who are in the periphery into the centre. The other thing <coughs> is, you people are all converted. You need to bring in, you need to identify those people who are almost converted and get them to be part of the conversation. But don't get stuck on the opponent. Don't try to convince the hard nut. I used to think, if I could convince 
I won't name yeah. any names, but if I could convince X that this was a good idea, and if I'd worked on that, and developing that skill, I'd get everyone. Oh my gosh, I had such a bad headache <laughs> after five years of working in that way in my own institution. Much better and much more fun to work with the people who want to do it and get, their, get other people to see what good things happen. Get them to bring people along. And when I ask people in my own institution, who do you go to when you want to know about internationalisation of the curriculum? You know what they said? Not me. No, not even anybody from the learning and teaching unit. The person down the corridor who maybe had had a little bit of experience in that area because they were part of the discipline community. So you people are really important as the seeds that can help make that wonderful, I don't want to get too far along with this metaphor, but you know, that <laughs> jacaranda tree flower or something at the time of the year. <laughs> um, Maria? Betty, um, I just wanted to ask from your perspective, how important is it for staff, for example, to have had the experience of being out of their own comfort zone in a, a different situation where they have to um, you know, experience uh, different worldviews, you know, as you said, with going to Canada. But how important is that to have that first-hand experience? I think it's very helpful. I don't think it's essential. I think you can have a kind of virtual international experience by working with your students. One of the first things that got me into this space was working with international students, watching them struggle, wanting to help them and knowing that I couldn't actually do some of it for them because this was all deeply personally embedded within them. But there is that resource there for us to work with. So I think it's important and you can certainly give it a boost. But you've also got to be able to reflect on that. You know, had I not had that experience in Shanton's workshop, maybe I wouldn't have even thought about the oval situation. It would have gone, oh, that, that's a bit of an odd oval, you know, without thinking about the full implications of it. There was one more question have we got. Yeah, um, just one quick one. Um, I'm Mary Tiger, and I'm the director of the Bachelor of Freedom Program. I'd like to thank you for telling us to imagine. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I'm sat here thinking we've got so many different projects within the university focused on the students that were in danger of being silos. So I'm sat here now thinking, how can I embed this into the student life cycle? And that's why I want your glo the global citizen slide because I'm thinking I'm going to use it in orientation and say this is what we want you to become and I'm also going to use it in our graduate celebration part. <coughs> So thank you. Thank you. Anyway, um, thank you, Betty, for a wonderful, deep, you know, thought-provoking um, presentation. I think we really looked at the formal and informal curriculum and the hidden curriculum and what we do in the classroom and what we're going to teach our students so they walk out as graduates of influence and going to be a global citizen and also um, influence others to be, you know, what's the difference between. Um, tolerance and uh, respect and I think that um, the analogy that um, Betty used is really good that we all have a role to play in trying to make a global citizen for the future. So thank you very much. Can we thank everyone?